Welcome everybody as you join us today. Uh, we'll just wait while everyone is joining um, the webinar. Um, you are, feel free to use the chat box or the Q&A box um, and make sure you indicate panelists and attendees. Let us know your name and where you're from. Hi everybody and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, just bear with us while we wait for a few more to join us. We've got a, a big uh, registration list today. Um, while you're waiting, if you want to put a uh, switch on the chat box, switch it to all panelists and attendees, pop your name in and say where you're from um, and welcome. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's webinar hosted by ECIS. ECIS is a not-for-profit organisation, the Educational Collaborative of International Schools, and we've been established for 55 years. We've got over 500 members in 78 countries. It's my pleasure today to introduce today's webinar. And um, as mentioned previously, we'll be sharing um, a recording of today's webinar afterwards. Um, and there will be an opportunity to ask questions through either the Q&A box or the chat box. And we'll share that with Jim shortly. As part of the ECS community, we've got a number of key partners who provide exemplary and innovative support and professional development for our international schools community. And I'm delighted to have Jim Ellis here today with us. Um, the theme of today's webinar is around creating meaningful change and developing new programs requires successful facilitation and a clear process to be most impactful. A critical role for all school leaders is often to design and implement programs and initiatives that shape our schools and the design process offers a wealth of skills you can use tomorrow. In this webinar, we will build the skills needed to maximise the results and be more efficient as you develop your school's programme. Jim is a consultant, blogger, facilitator and a classroom math design teacher in Vienna, Austria, and with a particular focus in designing thinking, designing educational experiences and designing structures for school improvement. All about design, eh, Jim? I always find Jim's webinars such insightful and positive experiences. So I'd ask you to pop your phones away and switch off your emails. This next hour is your opportunity to focus on these principles and your development. Please join me in welcoming and handing over to Jim. Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much, Georgie. I really appreciate the opportunity to continue to work with ECIS. It's always a pleasure um, and welcome to everyone uh, recorded or, or live or otherwise. So um, I want to share a story with you in about three parts uh, and that those three parts have a lot to do with how I've uh, envisioned a lot of my work over the years, but also my hobbies. I'm in Vienna, Austria, where I live. I have this fun little scooter here um, and it's a part of my design uh, characteristic and it's uh, a piece of who I am as a, as a person, what I've learned in university in the world around me, kind of all of those things mixed together to make this thing happen here. And a lot of that tells me, uh, uh, I could tell that same story about uh, education, my classroom, the colleagues I work with, this, the school that I work for. A lot of it is that mixture of environment and experience and, and personality. Um, and we can drive that narrative. We can push through what we are creating every day um, intentionally, um, in many cases, and sometimes unintentionally. So I, I hope to tell you that intentional story using design thinking um, in sort of three parts. So let's go over what those three parts are. And that's my personal contact. I'll pop that up at the very end again as well. And that's my family. They're really nice. I like them a lot. That's uh, Nina and my daughter Mia. And we live in Vienna, Austria, like mentioned a couple of times already. Um, so part one um, has to do with uh, growing your management toolkit. Um, and I hope you're here today and watch or watching this video largely because you feel very successful about the things that you've already done in education, but you're learning to broaden your, your own toolkit. So I wish to take a lot of what we see in the best universities and organizations and even school institutions themselves that you've been a part of or have read books by these great authors and, and kind of add to that toolkit, a, a new layer. And that first part to me is a management toolkit style that has to do with common language, um, mapping, 
uh, and de- creating some demand that you seek uh, through the, the changes you want to make on the campus you work for or the organization that you work for um, and making that plan of action happen um, and ma- managing it kind of in flight, kind of all of those steps. And I want to tell you that through my own personal experiences, uh, some of the consulting work that I've done. So I'll, I'll sort of story tell part one. Part two really is the design process. And the design process itself has, if you Google it right now, you'll see a bunch of different em- images, usually with hexagons. Um, and those hexagons uh, are usually six or eight in part, and they have a, a very similar vibe to all of them. The version I'd like to tell you today is personal. I hope it's full of knowledge. And it's also a little bit different than what you've seen before. I would call this my carefully handcrafted version over the, the last 20 years that I've been working. Um, I would say that this is what I've really rested upon to be able to do great work. And finally, the third and last part um, is my favorite. If, if part two was the, I don't know, the, the main course, then part three is the dessert and oh, what is a dessert it is. I, I really love this stuff and these ideas. So I hope you hang tight for this part at the end. It's, it's really a phenomenal finish, if you will, uh, to um, building into design thinking um, if you're brand new to it or if you've uh, uh, grown well accustomed to it over the last several years as that trend has really developed in education. Um, I, yeah, I studied design in university and so when I became a teacher, these things have kind of merged. So I would call that kind of where, where I've used these pieces over the last 20 years um, uh, to, to tell a great story and to do great work on campuses. All right, so let's start with part one, uh, the d- developing a common language is what I want to begin with. Um, and where I first want to start is at FIS, Frankfurt International School. And I was invited to their campus last year, last November. Um, and when doing so, I uh, began to work with the site administrator and we recognized that he wanted to bring in lots of different pieces from all over the campus in order to get them to begin to talk to one another about a, a bigger vision for their school and kind of where they're headed um, when it comes to uh, their middle school um, design program. And, and yet they had a lot of re- um, interrelated pieces that didn't necessarily see each other each day. Um, many of them would be in different parts of the campus. If you're thinking about STEM, science is often one part of their building, math is in another. There's a whole design wing for them as well. And so to pull that many different uh, folks together, I started them off with an activity to build a common language together. Yes, they work at the same school. Yes, most of them are from the same generation. Uh, and, and yes, they're all in education. But uh, that doesn't mean that the, the same words that they're using mean the same things or that they have a common set of words to do a common set of things. So by pulling this group together, the first activity I wanted to do with, with them was to ask them to draw a toast. Uh, there's a guy who made this famous in a TED Talk, um, but it is, it's, it's brilliant. And, and just because it's on TED Talk, we don't have to roll our eyes. It is really a phenomenal idea. And so I've done this with many schools, many groups, even student groups before. And in, at FIS, I asked them to draw a toast, and here's one image of how they started to envision it, sort of uh, pieces of the story linking to a central uh, node in the middle. Uh, this one's a little more chaotic, however, and these are groups discussing these for up to an hour as we work out this exercise and try to figure out what we're doing with this. And, we, and, and in this one, th- there's a lot more chaos, but it's pretty rich with ideas as well, too. So at FIS, these folks were learning to talk to each other for about an hour. Their colleagues, they see a lot, um, but we wanted to dial in some specific language and, and modalities for working together. After sort of warming up to that phase, we then moved into a phase beyond the language part. And I just kind of want to show you that. I know it's getting ahead at the moment. Uh, it's the mapping one. Um, but they did create some really neat maps. And uh, this is one of their maps that they created with a big question at the end. And uh, you can see it was even sort of decorated with what looks like uh, yellow lights around it where it says the big question. So after this fun activity, I'll tell you more about it soon in the in part two. After we did uh, the draw toast and worked out very specific ideas as to how we would do communicate and map, um, they came to some really neat aha moments. And these aha moments were an opportunity for these uh, colleagues to uh, recognize what they had in common. And that allowed them to springboard forward from there. Of course, 
the 2019-2020 academic school year didn't happen the way anyone thought it would, of course. So I'm, I'm willing to bet that some of their work got interrupted, but they, they have this new uh, foundation to work from the next time that they're able to revisit these ideas. My campus did the same thing, and that's where part two comes in, generating common understanding. So we have the common understanding sort of vision from them. They knew what they wanted, but I'll show you kind of a failed example, if you will. But even failures themselves can be pretty amazing. So here we have a mapping from my school, uh, the American International School of Vienna. And there we had our colleagues working together as well with sticky notes. I'm gonna give you some really great ideas as to how to use those more effectively uh, momentarily as we get into part two. But you, anyhow, you can see them sort of talking about it, debating it, or arranging it, grouping. Um, and we got this group to uh, make several different maps. Um, we have team mixed bag and the eighth grade team. And you see it, the right one says, now what? That was their aha moment. Now what? Um, after having mapped out the components of our program together as uh, a faculty on a retreat, which is a very amazing opportunity before the school year had started last school year, um, we recognized something about ourselves. We were not ready to take the next step that we wanted to take. And having recognized that was as big of, a, of an aha moment as we could have imagined for ourselves at that time. I'm thrilled that we were able to organize an understanding as to who we are, communicate about how we communicate, how we map, and how we talk to one another. Um, but it didn't, you know, it didn't make something new. It, it, it told us what we needed to do next. So that mapping in this case wasn't as successful as maybe what FIS had, a new foundation. And for us, it was uh, to relook at what we were doing. Um, part three is about creating the demand that you seek. So I was invited out to a campus, uh, St. Joseph's Youth Camp in Northern Arizona in the United States. Uh, I was a director there for many years and many of the people who had worked for me are now there directing themselves and they had some needs and they wanted, you know, I'm a designer and a builder and, and I work with my hands and that scooter that you saw at the very beginning started off um, as a rusty broken thing and I built it into this beautiful black metal bar thing. And so building is, is something I really enjoy. And this campus wanted to invite me out to work with their young teachers and also build this. And so during uh, a full week of consulting at a campus that I'd worked at before, I'd sort of arranged a pattern with this to, to build that demand. I thought, okay, they really, um, everyone on campus wants this thing called a Gaga ball pit. So why don't I spend my mornings working on that with them? It's also, you know, the, the heat, it's not quite as hot during the time of day. All the young teachers were coming out uh, regularly to work with me on this and I was sharing my story with them and they're sharing their story with me and I'm getting invested with them and I'm learning about them as people. I'm, I'm learning about their story and, and being invested in that. Then by lunchtime, I was watching their classes. We had put the hammers away and the concrete and the, and the wood and I was watching them teach. I was watching how they talk to their students, how they arrange um, different programming for a summer camp, which can range from anything from uh, literacy to mountain biking, to painting, to cooking. It, it doesn't really matter. They have all sorts of classes. So I was spending a lot of time kind of wandering in and out of their classes. And then by the evening, I was sitting around and talking with them about the program and asking, asking them good questions and bringing them back some interesting things that I had seen. And one of those things I had seen was communication. So before long during that week, as we're building a relationship and I'm investing in them and I'm building that demand for change, I was able to point out this large board by their dining hall door or their mess hall door. And, and it's a mess, as you can see, it's, it's uh, not communicating much to anybody. So by leading them through um, some interesting questions, we got to this. Um, the scale isn't really here, but this is a really large uh, piece of a wall inside of their mess hall with really large um, objects now, sort of little icons. And our discussion around communication led to this as being one of the first um, talking points we had that we want students to drink as much water as we can. The forests of Northern Arizona are quite dry. And it's this big thing that is a constant throughout their day. So the drink more water droplet became emblematic of the type of communication changes that we were making. Uh, they changed how they talked to the students or to the campers, when they talked to them, uh, what's in their message, what isn't, um, all sorts of aspects of communication. 
And by the time that week was done, not only had they made this, but they had completely reshaped one of the seminal events of their campus um, that happens on a Sunday night based off of the work that we had done together. And if I had just come in to do that or come into even a group that I'm familiar with, that I work with every day, if I hadn't built that demand in some way, I don't think I would have been nearly as effective. So I spent a lot of extra time working to build that demand at that moment when I knew that we were going to make some positive change in one way or another. Uh, developing a plan of action, part four. Um, this one was done in Ethiopia at Bingham Academy. Uh, and in this case, I was flown in to fix a problem that was already very well identified. And you'll see in the uh, design thinking um, method or design process that that's step one. Luckily, I was coming in and that was already done. Um, I was really thrilled about that. And um, this campus knew exactly what they needed to improve on, but the how wasn't uh, in place yet. And for them, it, it really was an action plan. And so we, again, engaged in the design thinking process. We created a lot of sticky notes under different concepts of why we were doing these things. And ultimately, we were trying to arrange at a foundational question that, that needed to be uh, very well articulated. Um, sort of a self-study that we were doing. That's going to be part two of our design process shortly. And it came to this question. How can we define, measure, and communicate expected student growth in an efficient, effective, and transparent way? So once we had that question down and we had all of these nodes, as I will soon call them, these sticky notes, we needed to find a way to arrange it meaningfully. And that's where this mapping came in. And we had done a lot of the, the draw toast and a lot of other exercises and a lot of work about their campus for a full day and a half. And by the time that we were able to do that, we, we were able to boil down what sticky notes or nodes were left over down to the salient, most critical pieces that their um, campus needed to address, what, what their story was really about. Not what everyone in the community could put on a board, not all of those sticky notes, but the critical ones. And now the arrangement of those sticky notes were gonna happen rather quickly. And sure enough, within uh, a half of a day, they, through lots of conversation and careful consideration with administrators and teachers alike, teacher leaders, we started to group in how and when things were gonna happen. And we finished off with a four year plan for that campus to make the improvements that they needed to make. That is a phenomenal thing to be able to do in two days. My idea for the, for the plan was to call it the tortoise, the monkey, and the lion. And as you can see, that got crossed out. Um, someone on the team, I think a teacher leader, thought of a better frame. They were the, the, the Bingham logo as a, as a lion. So they decided to go with a cub for year one, uh, lion for year two, king for year three, and the pride for year four, which kind of fell off of that board. As you can see, we were... Um, <laughs> we were thinking outside the paper a little bit, but there are some really uh, discrete things that are going to happen in each of these years that was meaningful to them. And they recognized that pathology of when and how those things would happen, but they also had the why. They were very clear as to what they were going to do. And, and to put a, a real point on this um, topic, their community was unhappy with how they were doing some of the work they were doing as a school. They knew they needed change. Um, it was just an opportunity to spend two days to figure out how that change was going to happen from, as you can see here, universal screening literacy um, and math in year two to designing assessments in year three, um, as well as some uh, things in other categories, um, looking at their grading scale and their green category, finding a cycle of, of rubrics and building core skills and science and math and other subjects to mapping. So it was a very comprehensive plan that was built into a series of stickies that for a full year after I visited that campus in um, April of 2008, the Google Docs I'd set up for them were being accessed. So they kept coming back to this stuff over and over again. It kept feeding them for more than a year. And that's a pretty remarkable thing to do within about a two-day span. Um, now, when you're in the middle of doing the thing you had set out to do and, and you've spent a lot of effort designing and planning and, and creating the new initiative for your campus or your organization. Um, what you probably want to be able to do is to address those needs 
in flight while problems are going on. And design thinking, I, I do fully believe, can also do that. So I'll give you a quick idea as to how that happened at the American School of Bombay. I was, the, I was there in uh, March of this year, just before uh, coronavirus sort of hit globally. Um, I think I got one of the last flights out of uh, India back to uh, Germany uh, before this all happened. And, and we were able to make this. Um, we took an old broken down three-wheeled uh, rickshaw, which is an awful lot like the thing I have here in Vienna. So there was a bit of a connection there. And students were able to build this thing with teachers, with people that work in their uh, workroom, their school workroom. Administrators were involved coming in and out regularly to see what was going on. And even after the students had set a plan like this girl's doing on the whiteboard here, and they had executed that plan, there was, there was always up to the last minute, there was a reason to use design thinking. So I'll highlight one quick example of that. Uh, these two girls wanted a swinging door. And the reason why they wanted a swinging door was because during the design process in self-study, they talked a lot about how these rickshaws are used. Um, besides being a, a, a great scary ride in around the city, um, you would notice drivers oftentimes sleeping in their scooters in between shifts or, ri or rides or however it might be, and they might nap. So these girls wanted to create a space on the inside of this uh, new mobile library um, where students could climb in and read a book in comfort, uh, similar to how a driver might enjoy that space as well on the street. Um, and they wanted a swinging door to kind of um, make that a reality that there could be books on the face of it, but it would open. Um, but where you see the girl gripping this uh, swinging door before uh, it got painted and installed and everything, there appears to be kind of a rough cut in that space. There was often moments in trying to make this feature work and it, and it didn't work for us very well. Um, I'm there as the expert, but there's uh, some teacher leaders there that know the, the lay of the land, they, they know the tools. Uh, people from the, the, the workroom were coming in and out, administrators were talking about the swinging door. And there were times when there were more adults than students. And in order to keep the students the central feature of their own story, of their own project, um, I had to access design thinking to go back to the beginning sometimes and ask, well, what is the problem? And you know, what is the research that we've done around this issue that we're talking about right now? What, is the, what are the different ways we could consider doing this? And kind of walking all of us, the adults and the students alike, back through this process in a noisy, noisy workshop. Um, all in an effort to both be successful, but also to be certain that the designers, the students themselves could stay at the center of that. And, and in some cases, this is where uh, an administrator needs to keep a teacher at the center of their story, or a board of directors needs to keep students uh, in mind, whatever it might be, that design process can facilitate um, a recognition of uh, the process that's ongoing and where we are in that process and what the logical next thing to do would be. Um, and we ended up making a really neat mobile library and there's the swinging door. <laughs> it looks like it's leaning to the side, but it's, it's solid, I promise you. <laughs> um, that day, by the way, that was the final day on campus for this school, um, that school year. They did not return to campus because of coronavirus. So they were virtual after this day. So th those big beaming smiles, this, this was their final memory. Uh, prior to taking off to the adventure of a, a brand new world in a pandemic. Um, wonderful project. So that was part one. Um, I hope that kind of warmed you up and I hope you're sticking around for part two, which is really the, the, the main part of it. How, do, how does all this stuff work and where are the tools behind it? Because at this moment, maybe I've been able to tell you a great story of the pieces and, how, and, and why they work for me, but I'm not yet giving you that uh, deliberate toolkit. So here it is. Um, defining the problem is the absolute first and most important thing that you can do. Um, and that's this major difference right here, um, verification versus validation. So in design thinking, a lot of times when you Google this, you'll see the word empathy in there. And, and I don't disagree with the word empathy, but I, I use uh, define the, the problem specifically because uh, of these two words here. And if we're not defining what we're meaning and what we're doing, we often make false starts or, or, or false attempts at making meaningful change in our own organization. Um, whether you have a facilitator from the outside or not, you need someone on the inside at least that's willing to help move you forward um, that is trying or attempting to 
uh, parse out what you're doing. Are you verifying or you're validating? So you can verify that you are answering the questions that have been asked, but validation is to validate that you are asking the right questions. If you're not asking the right questions, I don't care how often you are answering the questions correctly. And as a math teacher, <laughs> you might see the math teacher in that when I'm, when I'm saying this. You can design an equation, but if it's the wrong equation and you've solved it, it doesn't matter. Um, it's the same thing goes for design thinking for designers around the world. If they're designing shoes or cars or buildings, it doesn't really matter. And it should be the same for us. Educators are designers. We are designing the tools that the students use. We're designing their assessments. We're designing the schools. We're designing the physical schools in many cases, along with professionals who you know, build buildings called architects. But we're, we're designing literally everything about our campuses um, and regularly. And if we're not validating that we're asking the right questions, we've made a big misstep and we're about to make a lot of mistakes along that way. This video, by the way, um, and this whole slideshow is already on my blog and you can go have this slideshow with everything in it that you've seen so far, including these great videos. I have a video for each step and I highly recommend uh, watching this and going back to do a little more homework after this uh, webinar and going to my blog, uh, schooldesign.com, that's spelled funny, S-K-H-O-O-L, uh, design.com and you can find this there um, also it's all over YouTube of course um, and in this case this brilliant designer Stephanie Robar talks a lot about verification versus validation and she uses this wonderful quote from Albert Einstein a bit cliche but uh, Albert Einstein says as she notes in this video um, if I had to save the world in one hour I would spend 55 minutes trying to make sure I'm asking the right question and five minutes trying to find the answer. And she notes in design, oftentimes people jump over the validation part. And I know in education as an educator uh, for many, many good years that oftentimes we rush to the answer too quickly and we don't allow ourselves the time to carefully validate that we are asking all the right questions first. If there's anything you get out of today and it's this, I, I definitely believe that you can make an impactful change on your campus tomorrow. Just talk about verification versus validation and start sorting that out in meetings and you will see a shift in the direction that you go. Now, even better than that is when you get onto those sticky notes again. And you might've heard me say nodes and links already. Um, this guy, Tom, he uh, uh, has this brilliant TED talk that discusses how you arrange these nodes and links and why you might wanna arrange them the way that you do. Um, it, a lot of it has to do with how people collaborate and how many you want on a single board. The one that we saw for Bingham Academy had sort of three boards in one. We saw kind of a band of yellow and green, and I think orange might've been the other color, or yet, I, I don't remember. And um, each of those were telling their own different stories about their school development. So a node you would consider to be the sticky note itself, the single idea that lives on a sticky note or a note card or a, a single drawing element on a paper drawing if you're not using sticky notes. The link might be the arrow or um, a grouping of a circle around a series of them. Um, anything that defines the space around the nodes that you're gonna draw um, or even just the spatial um, linking of them together uh, in groups uh, in, an, in a certain space could be called a link. And if what you're doing with your sticky notes as people are modeling, the first thing is you're putting ideas in a more democratic uh, open space that everyone gets to work on. If you're just talking about a problem, it's going to be the loudest voice that wins, period. I don't care how good of a facilitator you are, you need a physical place for your stuff to live. And if you put them on movable nodes like sticky notes or note cards, However, they're movable, I don't really care. Um, those nodes become a piece of the democratic process to make something new happen on your campus that hadn't happened before or in your organization. And those links become how you tell that story. For Bingham Academy, it was year sort of by bars, year one, year two, year three. Um, at the AIS Vienna example you saw, it was kind of drawing groups around it to sort of define characteristics about our campus. Um, no matter how your group decides to do it, free form or being told what to do, um, there will be meaning inside of that space because of the way in which you've organized the links. And the nodes that you keep and the nodes that you remove or throw away 
also do an equal part job to tell that story as well. Um, and in doing so, uh, as you see here, it says organize a systems model. In doing all that work of, of writing, arranging, removing, uh, analyzing a series of nodes, you've created uh, a systems model. Um, and there's some pretty amazing ones in this video. I, I hope you do go and watch it. It's, it's a brilliant TED talk. Um, then brainstorm and analyze. There's just three quick tips I wanna share with you about this one. Uh, capture everything, encourage participation and ask clarifying questions only. That last one's really hard. Human, we don't like to do that. Humans are not into that. If you can capture everything, that's where you give everyone a big stack of sticky notes or note cards. Everyone can create something and now their voices are gonna be heard. And as that conversation goes on, you want every member to continue to have access to those sticky notes and to continue to be able to write more. And that participation, honestly, that encouraged participation piece is the, the giving them of the pencil and the, the paper. It gives everyone, uh, people who feel comfortable speaking out loud and folks who don't, it gives them a voice. Uh, my best groups that I will manage or run when I go into an organization, you will see who talks and who doesn't, but everyone's writing. So while someone's talking, almost at all times in one group somewhere in the room, there's someone writing and a new note is going up un uh, until it's time to start paring them down and getting those nodes down to the essential group and the links start occurring. And even then people are linking by drawing arrows or making groups or moving stickies around. So you can keep your process democratic by making it a physical experience as you uh, tackle some of your most difficult problems on your campus. Um, and that for me captures what the brainstorming process or ideation is all about. Um, in step four, this might feel a little bit wild and you might want to write something as a comment like, I don't like this idea, Jim. <laughs> Go ahead. I challenge you to do that because it's a bit wild. And in schools, we definitely don't think ever about doing this or that we even have the capacity to. And that is to prototype multiple solutions. That is to leave your design process with multiple possible answers and sending multiple groups of people off to go do those multiple answers. I'll give you a, an example of where that might be the case. Um, I'll back up to step one. Maybe it's gonna be uh, designing new um, math assessments for third grade because you recognize students are learning but it, it's not being captured on the actual assessment. So you work really hard to validate that um, you're gonna be able to uh, ask the right questions about what's wrong in the assessments. Um, in step two, you've got a lot of ideas out and you're starting to, to shape a narrative and a story amongst groups of teachers that work well together, but are, are very strong-willed and they have a lot of different ideas. So you, you can tell that there's gonna, the paring down is gonna be difficult, but you do that work and, you, and, you've, and you've modeled something. And now in step three, it's time to bring out those ideas and come up with um, from your central question and your validated correct questions to ask and your model, what are the obvious solutions that we have here to do? And if you've done steps uh, one and two well, three will be, uh, the answers will come in a more narrow package. It won't be any idea anyone can think of because we have a really deliberate frame here now that we're going to be able to offer to our um, participants to begin to brainstorm. But you still wanna capture everything. And in doing so, you may still not be able to say the exact final answer that comes out of this. So you might send some groups off to write the, a new assessment that is the rational choice, the meaningful choice, and the wild choice. Three different assessments you might leave and ask them all to make with the understanding that not all of them are going to go into practice. And I know that that's just a totally wild idea for us to do in education to have people duplicate work because Time is of the essence in schools. I get that. But if you can prototype as many as three different answers, you can do the rational choice, the thing that your campus would normally do. What is it that you guys are capable of doing? How do you usually do it? Go and make that one happen. What is the rational idea out of everything that's being brainstormed? Then what is the meaningful choice, which to me is that step further. Um, where do we think we actually can go as a campus, given who we are today, what we have available to us or as an organization? And where would we likely go next? The third one is the wild choice. That to me represents what is something that is far beyond where we think we can be today, but we can envision it as an idea in brainstorming. 
have those three different assessments be written out and look at them. Are we capable of doing the wild choice? In some cases, no, you, you can't do it. And that poor person's time might feel wasted, but you've learned something out of it. There's no doubt about it. But sometimes you can, sometimes you are ready for that wild choice. And in doing so, you've taken a much greater leap as a campus with a parachute. If the parachute is having the rational choice ready to go, is having, ha having the meaningful one ready to go, you've now accomplished something even further beyond what you thought you might've been able to do. And you can envision that about assessment writing. You can, it could be redesigning the, the parking lot drop-off for your campus. It could be the entire governance, governance structure of your organization. No matter what that is, if you prototype multiple ideas, you don't have to leave the brainstorming stage with a single idea. You don't, we, you don't have to argue down to that last bit and then leave that room with something agreed upon before you even began to prototype anything. Leave with multiple ideas, categorize as multiple ideas as rational, meaningful, or wild. Get everyone back in the same room after that prototyping has taken place a week, a month, whatever time it takes, and look at the three things that you've created and really evaluate who you are as a campus, as a committee, um, whatever that group might be, and ask yourself, what are you guys really ready for? Um, it's a phenomenal event when you can do it. I've, I've always been thrilled, almost goosebumpy when I get back to those meetings when multiple things have been prototyped, multiple ideas have taken place, and you get to look to see what has happened. It really is a phenomenal thing. Um, I did put a, a tip there for prototyping. You got to put your ego in check. There's no doubt about it. Whatever comes back is something that's prototyped you're going to have to realize that that is now reality because you sent multiple groups out to go make multiple things or you're part of one of those groups. And now something's going to happen. Maybe yours is chosen or it's not. You, you have to wreck. You, you did your best work, of course, but it, you know, it may have been doomed from the beginning. So you, you have to go into that knowing that as a community, you're going to be better, even if the individual's um, participation doesn't go into say production, let's say in, into reality that third graders won't take your test or that model of doing um, uh, redesigning the car park drop off doesn't become yours. Um, and you got to listen a lot. There's there's at this stage, listening becomes more critical than ever before. I think listening is only halfway important in brainstorming because everyone's got their own notepad. They're, they're recording stuff down and they're thinking in their own brains a lot. And so there's a lot of independence in the brainstorming phase, but in prototyping, everyone's involved and everyone has to listen very carefully to each other. Um, and that gets to one, uh, one of my two last bits here about this design thinking method for improving your campus or solving big problems in your campus. And that is making sure that you've designed in feedback. I love this little video. If you get a chance to watch it, she's got, just got the best Southern American accent in the world. And she's talking about washers and dryers and it's phenomenal. And it's this idea. Um, if, and this is a very Amer American centric idea. If you uh, have a, a, a dryer, just a standalone dryer, not a washer dryer combo, I think, or maybe even that too, but if you're using the dryer setting on one of these machines for your clothing. Um, you could set a timer and then after 30 minutes or 45 minutes, it just shuts off. And you go back to the machine and you find that your clothes are way too dry potentially and you wish it had stopped earlier because now it's damaging your clothing or perhaps it's not dry enough um that's fine if you use a timer but there's no sensor on it uh to tell the machine when to stop instead um, and that's called a feedback loop in the design world in engineering and it can be in school too a feedback loop can ask us when we've met our goal so a machine that has um, a sensor inside the, the dryer that's checking moisture, a moisture sensor, it can keep asking over and over and over again, be programmed to ask, is it dry enough yet? No, let it keep going. Is it dry enough yet now? Nope, let it keep going. Is it dry enough now? Yes, turn the machine off. Um, and we can do the same thing in a lot of the things we design. So after we've prototyped, and we're about ready to get uh, into a launch phase of whatever new thing we're doing, our new governance at our school, the new car park drop-off for students, or our new third grade math test. Um, right before you do that, you wanna sit down and make certain that you have criteria that tells you if you've been successful or not. Because one of the greatest ways I see organizations lose 
work that they had spent years developing or, or trying to take care of their programs, years of just maintenance, um, a lot of the stuff can degrade and fall apart. Um, because of lack of care in some cases or management turnover or all sorts of things. But if you have sensors built in, if you have feedback built into what you're designing, um, then you know when you've been successful and you can also know if it falls off of successful. If that car park idea is successful, maybe um, the entire process of dropping students off in the morning takes place in 25 minutes. And it starts off at 30 minutes and you make some small adjustments and your, your idea is a good one, but it needs to be tweaked a little bit. Your, your uh, people that are charged with doing this work will know that, the, that you need smiling faces, no one honking at each other and no, no parents getting mad at each other. And the whole thing has to happen in 25 minutes. Let's say those are your, your feedback criteria. And regularly they're checking to make sure that that is actually taking place. And once they, the, the horn stop, no one's mad at each other, um, and uh, you've gotten down to 25 minutes, all those small adjustments are done, and now you have a successful program. It doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. If those three criteria, let's say, stay in place, then if something changes and now it's going from 25 minutes to 35 minutes, someone's going to know and be in charge of getting the group back together and say, one of our criteria isn't working. Everyone's happy, there are, are no horns, but it's 35 minutes. And I'm pretty sure we're gonna get some unhappy people as a result of that. So we need to, again, look at what our process is and figure out how we're going to, to change this. And maybe it's by the change of weather. It worked in the fall, but not in winter when it's snowing. You know, that's sort of a, of a thing. So keeping your feedback as a constant um, monitor for your program, whatever that might be, will help keep it young and vital rather than growing old and needing a whole brand new redesign again, because you've left that criteria in place and someone in charge of it and that action is moving forward. And yeah, again, make small changes, make big changes, iterate. And with that feedback set, set up and ready to go, you're ready to improve your design. There's no doubt about it. Um, and this, this guy is hilarious. So please, again, go to, <laughs> go to my website, get this slideshow uh, and watch this video at least. Uh, he is the, uh, his name is Samuel West and he runs the Museum of Failure. Really, it's, it's a brilliant thing. So um, go check that out. Okay, now for me, that's, I feel like my work is done. We got about, I don't know, less than 20 minutes to go. Um, and hopefully you're still with me, but I feel like the stress is off of me at this point. I'm just going to have some fun with you guys and show you some really great skills that you can use. And these terms are design terms and designers use them and educators don't right now. However, I really think we should be using these in education. I really believe this should become common terminology everywhere. And so I will be a salesperson for these things and many more. Um, in other uh, webinars and other programs that I do and article writing, because I think that these have the power beyond knowing the design process, beyond building your management toolkit, being able to talk about these on your campus can give a huge aha moment to anyone in your community anywhere. And that's this part three, this curb cuts, hostile design, um, uh, this thing called UX design, user experience, something called the Cobra effect, and finally, what uni universal design really is. So let's talk about curb cuts first, because um, a lot of times in education, we think that um, if we do something to help the neediest on our campus, then we've not done something to help the rest. And I want to tell you that that's, that's a myth. It's, it's, it's wrong. Oftentimes, the things that we do for the bottom one third of our population, once correctly identified and we've um, validated it's the right question and all that good stuff, um, and we know what we need to do to help that bottom one third group, that thing will help many more. So this idea behind a curb cut is to lower the, the, the ledge and cut into that curb and allow a wheelchair to go down uh, smoothly from the sidewalk level down to the street level. Um, and as it turns out, this did start in California, I believe in the 1960s. This is the first time curb cuts were uh, really systematically used anywhere in the entire world ever. And it was for people in wheelchairs, but pretty quickly we found out that other people in society could use that. And now we have uh, cutouts on street corners that look like this. 
lighted uh, reflective strips, um, textured surfaces, a graduating sloping version down onto a very clear path across the street. Um, and, and oftentimes when I'm doing this live with a group and there's one favorite answer and I'm always gonna have this favorite answer from this one fellow. Um, when I'm doing this live with groups, I say, who else um, would this corner, this curb cut benefit besides the neediest people in wheelchairs? And I get moms with buggies and delivery guys with the two wheel dolly and uh, blind people, all sorts of stuff. This one guy rose his hand and he said, drunk people in the middle of the night, that's who it helps. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you're right. Um, they, they, the reflective surface and the street lights, uh, they can see where it's coming. The haptic feedback by the textured ground, they can feel that under their feet. And the sloped edge will prevent them from falling down into the street, potentially hurting themselves you know, quite bad. So there's a lot of people in our society that can benefit from the many design changes that happened with um, in America with the ADA, the Americans for Disabilities Act, and a lot of that design language that was that came out of this uh, 1990 um, federal law uh, became great design principles around the world, whether it was sloping ramps and buildings and so on. But we often in education are solving real problems like ramps for wheelchair students type of idea, level of ideas where we didn't realize that it was going to help more people, but, but it does. So a lot of our uh, accommodations for our needy students are in fact better practice than what we were doing before for everyone. So the curb cut isn't for who you designed it for. It ends up becoming a feature of design for everyone. So finding those curb cuts is a big deal, but of course, sometimes it, it doesn't go right. Uh, you can have the best intention in the world, but if, if you don't design your initiative correctly, it's, it's not gonna work. So this, this curb cut always cracks me up. So I hope you're laughing at home right now because it's that's funny. Um, hostile design, guess what guys? Not everything we design for our students, and yes, we are designers, teachers and educators and people working in institutions of all kinds, we are designers. Sometimes we design some really wonderful things. And sometimes we design some kind of awful things. So let's talk about hostile design. And in architecture, it has some pretty obvious characteristics. This piece right here is uh, designed to keep um, rough sleepers out from underneath or selling people trying to sell stuff to passer buyers from underneath this overpass. Um, it doesn't solve the problem, as you'll see in some of these other ones. Like this is an another one about rough sleeping. Um, this is a window, I believe, in Budapest, a window ledge uh, in Budapest. And these little spikes there are trying to um, literally spike homeless people who might want to, to rough sleep in this spot. But metaphorically, we're, we're often spiking students as well. We're designing things that are meant to deter the behavior that we don't want, but it isn't necessarily solving the problem. We're not solving homelessness by putting spikes on this window we're just asking homeless to go, homelessness to go somewhere else. In many cases, we're not trying to solve a problem on a campus, we're actually just deterring it. So I've got, um, that one's, yeah, that's another one. Here's, here's another one that's pretty obvious as well, I'm trying to keep people away. And that maybe that vent was blowing out warm air and the homeless people can't, uh, that wanna access it or young people hanging out on the street that may wanna be there, they can't get there now. Um, it's just a very unfortunate feature. This one's about skateboarding, um, anti-skateboarding. Um, it's hostile design as well. Um, so before I move on from that, so wh where are we doing that in education? Um, there's a great example at my school that we don't do anymore. Um, when a kid forgot their lunch ticket, this uh, electronic card, they were asked to go get a stamp on their hand from the office. And they would have to go to the office and get the stamp that would stay there basically the rest of the day. We're, we're marking students. So they would say, we would tell them, no, you, you can't get your lunch, go, go get your stamp. Then they would have to wait in line until the line went all the way down. Then they could go in and get their lunch, still with a stamp on their hand. And that was very hostile design. So instead of solving the bottleneck where forgetting your card caused the line to slow down, we asked you to um, sacrifice yourself and ink on your hand to allow the line to go more quickly. Eventually we solved that problem without the hostile design of that. And, and I see other things like a penalty box, sign your name on this thing if you did something wrong and your class would get a prize at the end of the quarter if you didn't, um, if you got the least amount compared to the other courses or something like that or the other classes. 
um, late tickets. Um, I've seen uh, late tickets, material tickets, and homework tickets by teachers. If, if you hand out this ticket um, to a student to tell them that they've done something wrong, that's, that's spiking them. We spiked them with the stamp on their hand. We spiked them with the penalty box. We could spike a student by saying, you don't have your materials for class. They, maybe they forgot their pens and pencils, and now they have a small slip that they're getting from the teacher. And it says, material slip, go fill that out. But with what pencil? They, they, for, they literally forgot their pencils. If the, the problem is that they're not ready to learn, we could give them a pencil. We don't have to give them a piece of paper or spike them to tell them that they forgot their pencil. They know they forgot their pencil, but they still want to do work with you. As long as you, got, you and the, the, the teacher and the student can make that agreement that, that your partner's in their learning. But if you keep spiking students with um, more punitive type things, that partnership will break down and that trust will break down and the students won't achieve as much in your class or participate as much in your class as you were hoping for. So that's hostile design and spiking students. The Cobra effect is unintended consequences. Um, a lot of times when you're in that feedback loop and you're, and you're doing your, your, your design of your initiative, whether it's that parking lot thing or the math test or, or governance structure, unintended consequences come from this analogy about Cobra, the Cobra effect. Once upon a time, I believe this was a true story. Um, uh, I think in India, um, the um, imperial governor of an Indian city uh, didn't like cobras, and I can see why, and offered to pay the citizens of that city money for any cobra, dead cobra that, that they could, could get. And, and that goes against a lot of what um, Many people in India believe, but I, I do believe this is a true story and some people did do this. Um, they, dead cobras were coming in and they were getting their bounty and, their, and they were um, getting their money. So citizens were turning in dead snakes. Um, it sounds like you're solving the problem, except you created a market for, um, for cobras. And some very enterprising uh, local residents decided that they would raise cobras out on the edge of town and raise them to be large enough to be killed and then brought in for the bounty. That it was actually quite profitable to raise and, and kill cobras for this um, hope that they could remove or reduce the amount of cobras in the city. Um, that was not the intention of, of that imperial governor. It was uh, an accidental consequence. And in this case, we can call that the cobra effect. So after you've set off your initiative into the world, your new tests, your new uh, drop-off process, your new governance, you really want to keep in mind watching out for the Cobra effect and asking yourself, what were the unintended consequences that took place as a result of you putting in a new design with your new effort um, at your school? Sometimes the effect is bad, but sometimes it's great. You know, you didn't realize what was going to happen, but you want to make note of that. Like, because we made this thing, these other th great things occurred. And if we ever want to change this again, we got to remember the full story here of what actually took place. There was our initiative of the thing we did, but then these really neat other things off to the side seem to stem from the work that we did. And any change that we make needs to be thoughtful about that effort. All right, I'm about done. This is the last one. And then I can't wait to hear if you guys have any questions or just thank my wonderful partners at ECIS once again. Um, universal design goes back to that curb cut. And you see a picture here of all these sorts of different types of people in this um, uh, universal design uh, image. When you design something for someone, uh, you often think of a single user. But if you think of as many users as possible, then that single design that you create will be useful to more people um, instead of less. And a lot of times what happens in school is we're not doing universal design right. Sometimes universal design for us in education Education means doing something different for every kid. Every kid has a different thing in class that meets their needs. And that's going to exhaust teachers and exhaust the resources at a school. If you try to think about how can you design a single thing to meet as many needs as possible and constantly look at that um, utility of that thing that you're doing, like a test design, for example, then what you have in this case is something that's universally designed for all. Um, and this is a great bench that is not anti-homeless, but um, allows anyone who needs to rest uh, on this, you know, as much as possible, rest there or sit there or discuss with their friends 
whatever it might be that someone wants to use this for. And this is from a city in, in uh, Japan. Um, th that use is there. It's, it's a very well-designed bench. And if you Google hostile design bench, you're going to see all sorts of benches that make it impossible to do anything but sit straight up and down on a bench one person at a time. So I don't have a bunch of those examples and I'm kind of, I'm running short on time here today. So you can Google that and find all sorts of crazy things like holes in the bottom so that the cold air goes up or bars that go across the, the, the seating area so that no one could lay down that these armrest bars exist and many sorts of things. So this is a universally designed bench. It's truly beautiful. My grandma could have used um, the carrot peeler on the right. She had extreme uh, arthritis and near the end of her life, her, her hand really only did this sort of thing. Kind of looks like my hand. I think I'm going to, I'm going to have that same sort of problem when, when I'm older. And if she didn't have this old uh, carrot peeler, that was the only one you could get when she lived the, the bulk of her life. Um, that the one on the right, it, it just didn't fit her hand um, by the end of her life. But the OXO one on the, on the right is bigger, it's grippier, it's softer, and she could have put her hand around it. And the wonderful Mexican cuisine that um, she would make my family in Arizona, where I grew up as a Mexican-American, um, whether it's tamales or whatever she wanted to make, she could have made it longer in her life with tools that met her needs um, as her hands lost its utility. But even myself, I'm fully able to use both of these devices here. I would definitely choose the one on the right. I think it would be more comfortable. I think I would have a better grip and I think it would be easier work. I would reach in the drawer for the one on the right any day compared to the one on the left. That one on the right is universally designed for everyone. It would fit her needs exceptionally well. There's no doubt about it, but it would fit my needs as well. And I believe it would fit your needs as well. So when we look to design tools, assessments, uh, lessons, uh, our corridors in a school, if we're designing for everyone at the same time, um, we may not get there to 100%, but the closer we get, the better off we are and the more successful we're going to be as a school with singular, universally designed tools. My daughter, uh, think about this playground. My daughter had anxiety uh, when she first saw a playground like this. I noticed that her anxiety seemed to go away around the age of three when she first saw one that was uh, a playground that was built for wheelchairs. She used to be too afraid to play with bigger kids um, and she wouldn't want to go on these playgrounds. But you look at this one and you can clearly see that, that it's much wider than a normal one. And the first time she saw one of these, she ran up and down it and kids were coming by and they were on it too. And she didn't, she wasn't afraid. And I realized that this, this playground that she was on for the first time ever was wide enough for a wheelchair. Yes. But it was also wide enough for her anxiety of being trapped in by other bigger kids. So there's a, a real example of design, uh, universal, universal design in a school in a way that we can accommodate for more things than you can even see. We made this for folks with, in a wheelchair and it's great for my then three-year-old with anxiety. Um, there's another example, I'm kind of out of ideas. You can think about the different things that we can accommodate for and design as permanent, temporary and situational. I think that works for almost anything I'm designing as a teacher. Um, if it's a permanent disability, learning disability, if it's a temporary one, situational or otherwise. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm in middle school, so crying is a big one. Middle schoolers are pretty emotional. Situational feels like crying. If, if my design fits a crying kid really well, I know I've made it. Even if initially it was there to accommodate for a permanent learning disability of some sort. Um, I know in my ad, if you saw it on Twitter, I talked about affordances and signifiers. You have to wait for that one when we get to uh, this, this next one with um, Mark Overmeyer on November 10th, again with ECIS. Sorry, I put it in this ad. Um, but that, were, that was the three parts. Um, part one, you know, management toolkit, the actual design process handcrafted from me to you. And finally, the third part, which are these wonderful terms that I have many more of, but it's just a, a, the, the first flavor of my, of my favorite um, design terms for education. Um, yeah, and with that, I want to hear what you folks have to say, and um, if there are questions and comments, I didn't kind of invite uh, Joe or Georgie to jump back in, and, and again, I thank them as well for the time today. Jim, that was amazing. Thank you so much. All the concepts and ideas, and, and really actually encouraging us to sort of think outside the box, 
um, particularly going through that process as well um, is hugely, hugely fascinating. Um, I'm loving the fact that we actually all need to uh, work to try and find the meaningful choice. Um, but also there's part of me that would really like to take the world choice sometimes as well. So uh, <laughs> hugely, hugely appreciate that. And um, you covered the concept of curb cuts um, when we had our leadership conference. And um, actually, I think there's some really good examples there of actually designing something that suits sort of one group and demographic that actually benefits all. Um, and often we're sort of not aware of those different sort of changes. Um, and I think all of us actually, as you said, we, we need to make sure that we put our ego in check. We're all guilty of that sometimes. And uh, actually, if someone doesn't choose our idea, it doesn't mean it's not a great idea. It's just it's yeah. not the right one. Yeah. <laughs> How many times have we been there? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, we haven't actually got any questions at the okay. moment, but um, I do. I, I just reiterate that we're hugely grateful for you and we're looking forward to your next um, webinar coming up. Um, and we're looking to sort of develop a, f a future other sort of projects and, and things together as well. Um, and I, I'm, I know you're a very busy man. You're, you know, an excellent teacher and you're traveling all over the place when you can to support schools. So um, please follow Jim on Twitter. He's got some great ideas and concepts that um, he shares out all the time. So John, pop your bits back. Oh, I'll yeah. go back to that somewhere. Go back to the summer. Oh, look how much you've covered already. Yeah, right. <laughs> that was a lot. Yeah, so school design with a K H um, at uh, so at school design. Uh, follow Jim. That's his email address there or his website. Um, we will send this out as well after the um, call, with the recording. Um, and thank you everybody, and especially you, Jim, for uh, taking the time to be with us today. We've got lots and lots of feedback here, so thank you so much. Super. Thank you. It was wonderful. All right, Jim. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.